Have you ever wanted to hear from a person who's figured out the future? Well, our speaker is an unusual combination of intellectual and entrepreneur who spent his career doing just that. He started his career as a journalist, worked as a foreign correspondent in Asia for Newsweek, and has traveled to more than 50 countries. Since coming here to San Francisco 25 years ago to work with the founders of Wired Magazine, he's been an innovator and responsible for several startups. He's the author of two books, writer of many articles, and the host of several public interview series. Please join us in welcoming to the stage, Peter Lydon. Welcome, Peter. Go get him. Yeah. Great to be here, folks, with all you risk takers, risk people. Um, I am going to spend the, the end, wrap this all up, with a talk about how all of us on that side of the cliff are going to get to this side of the cliff and talk about the risk involved in that jump. Um, not quite the jump, but I am going to be talking about essentially a lot of the system changes that we're going to have to go through in the next decade here, ahead. The strategic paradigm shifts ahead in the next 10 years here. Now, when I thought about talking to you folks, I said, okay, what would you want to say to a bunch of folks who are dealing with the world of risk? And I would say this, in the biggest picture, the way to kind of think about where you're at right now is to think, essentially, we are going through, the world's going through a, a transformation, something that will be remembered for a long, long time to come, 50 years, 100 years, centuries, ultimately. Um, it's essentially the next 30 years in particular, we're going to see a variety, all kinds of system changes, all kinds of new technologies, all kinds of trends play out, which I'm going to basically talk to you a little bit today. I call it in general just the transformation. There's a whole talk I can give about that big picture story of what's going to happen in the next 30 years. But what I'm going to focus on for you folks, because you kind of want to get more grounded in strategy and business, is that next decade. This next decade is going to be essentially laying the foundations for many of these big changes, and they're going to actually require some unusually kind of agile maneuvering that you're going to actually have to think through, particularly from the level of risk or from the level, I like to think about, of opportunity. So what I am basically going to show you guys, I'm going to do several things, four things which are very ambitious, you could say, of what's going on here. I'm going to tell you what's really going on in the world right now. People have everyone in the media saying one thing, and everyone has their own idea of what's going on. I'm going to give you a kind of hit on a different way to think about what's playing out in, in, over our era here, but let's say in the next 10 years. I'm going to tell you what's probably coming. And I've had a pretty good track record over the last 10, 20, 30 years of actually making the call on what's coming and advising people and talking through people what's really coming. So I'm going to tell you what I think, actually, is going to happen here. I'm going to tell you what's possible to achieve, actually, in this next 10 years, because I think many of these technologies and these, these trends are essentially moving in a positive direction. If we do the right things, we can actually pull, solve many of the big challenges that are facing us today. And ultimately, I'm going to kind of allude to what you can do. Now, stay open. Listen to me. I'm going to make some really clear statements. I'm going to call it like I think it's going to call you have to make your own judgment. You have to think, how much is this guy on it? How much is he going to nail it? Is he 75% true, 60% true? But at the very least, you should really consider this. And some of the things might be a little more controversial. They might actually push you a little bit, and that may not be the way you th see things happening. But it's worth hearing me out. Now, I'm going to tell this story by starting with this guy. I don't know how many people here are sci-fi fans. But Apple Television came out with a series, started a series, which is going to be an annual series, uh, season one, with, of The Foundation. Now, The Foundation is based on the most famous sci-fi trilogy, you could say, that was written by Isaac Asimov in the 1950s. And the reason I want to talk to you about this is Asimov, who inspired Star Wars and all the different kind of film, television, and even other writers to come, he basically had this idea at the beginning, in the 50s, that we had just invented mainframe computers in World War II. And we had just entered the information age. We're starting to collect information. And he said, hey, 
if we keep collecting all this information and ultimately all this data over time, over many years, and we also get these more and more powerful computers, tools and methodologies to kind of sift through that data, we actually might be able to predict the future. And that's the idea behind this series. And this is the main character who figures out how to predict the future and rolls out in the whole series, which I'm not gonna give away. But what's interesting today is much of what he actually envisioned is actually playing out. And I'm a, it's relevant to what we're talking about today. For the first thing is the data. We have now got so much data around us, and I just wanna, for those that don't kind of know the numbers here, most people are familiar with terabytes. Gigabytes, terabytes, you kind of are on your phone now. We're gonna start moving into the era of uh, we're petabytes. You add three zeros, add another three zeros. You get exabytes, add another three zeros, and you basically get zettabytes. So just look at how that works, how much data is starting to put together. Now the reason I say this is if you go back to the beginning of human history, 10,000 years ago, 8,000 BC, and you go all the way to essentially 2003, all human beings came up with about five exabytes of data. That's not the lower one, the zettabytes, it's the one up like that. We are now creating about five exabytes of data every two days, and the world's data, entire data, is doubling every two years. We're into exponential growth, because why? Everything's digital, all your phones, everything's being captured, everything's being stored, everything's being able to be parsed through and understood. I couldn't even get it on the chart here, so you know, you just keep going. We're at about 60 zettabytes, that's that lower rung. And by 2025, we're thinking we'll probably be up to about 175 zettabytes. So the piece about data is we are surrounded by tons of data, which is gonna help us understand the future. The second piece is our tools, computer tools, AI now, uh, artificial intelligence, but also our methodologies, our tools to kind of understand the future, systematically start to think through the future, have also been refined since the 1950s. And this is one guy who you, uh, a guy named Stuart Brand, who is one of the key people who has really helped pioneer what we think of as strategic foresight. That's kind of the business way of thinking of strategic foresight. It happens that he founded a company called Global Business Network, of which I actually worked there. I worked closely with Stuart. He's still a mentor of mine. And he also started the Long Now Foundation, which is a way of essentially collecting people who are thinking long-term about the future. In fact, they're building, uh, some of you may have heard this, a, ten, a clock that's gonna work for 10,000 years. It's near completion. It's almost, it's sitting in, in, a, in a mountain underground in uh, Texas, about to be launched. So you'll, if you haven't heard about it now, you'll hear, hear about it soon. By the way, there's been a great biography of him, just came out, a documentary film just out on this guy. It's a really interesting character if you haven't heard about him, but he is a man who's really helped people think about the future. So it turns out there are these tools that actually make, help you think about the future. One is what I call the inexorables. There are some technologies, some trends that are going to happen, play out under any scenario. They're actually gonna play out in the next 10, 20, 30 years. I call them the inexorables. They're inexorably gonna happen. You can channel them a little bit, you can slow them down a bit, but they're gonna happen. Now there's all kinds of them, and I do a whole nother talk about this, but there's, you know, we're gonna touch on some of these. Like everybody on the planet's gonna get connected. Universal connectivity. AI is gonna be readily available to everybody at all times, very much in the next sh short time here. We're gonna transition into towards clean energies. We're gonna move towards electric mobility. We're gonna actually, really refine our genetic understanding of how do we run? How do all living things run? We're gonna be able to manipulate that so we can actually construct and tweak and evolve the human genome, but other genome. And there's things like generational changes are absolutely gonna happen. If someone's 20 years old now and 10 years are gonna be 30, we can play those out. And we can play about how that's gonna impact politics and other things. Anyhow, this is the inexorables in terms of maybe how it hits in America here. There's other ones too though, globally, that are just gonna happen. Climate change, I'm gonna to touch on that. There's a bunch of things here I could talk more about, we just don't have the time to do it, but I am gonna to touch on several of these inexorable developments that are happening and will continue to happen over the next 10, 20, 30 years. Now, that's inexorably happening. For you folks, the risk folks, there's another category that you really gotta take into mind. So if, 
Human beings are crazy people. I mean, people, it's hard to figure out exactly what people are going to do. There's psychology, all kinds of things about humans that you can't predict with certainty. And so what happens in the field of strategic foresight is you've got to think through all these different places, all these different areas of economics and politics and geopolitics, culture, society. How is, what's going to play out? And that is a way that will impact any business plan, any kind of risk kind of uh, plan that you folks are working at. You've got to think with a big lens of what's going on. And there are techniques for that, too. And what I call, they're called critical uncertainties. is one of the ways we think about it. We, there are some things that are uncertain. Take a topic, could go this way, could go that way. If it's critical, we don't focus on all of them, but some of them are critical to your business or to what's going on. And what I'm going to do today, because you're the risk people, is I'm going to go through a bunch of these. And I'm going to tell you where I think they're going. And you don't have to believe me, but you can listen to me and think, what if he's right? Now, the biggest picture way to understand what I'm going to lay out here today is essentially we are going from a world that most people in this audience here for the last 40 years of your career has been defined by a certain set of systems, small systems that added up to a mega system, and that system though, is essentially going to be increasingly we're going to let go of that system. So, for example, for the last 40 years, our mega challenge had been climate change. Energy had been carbon energy. Transportation was the internal combustion engine. Culture was a very boomer-centric culture, both in the United States and also Europe and all over. Politics tend to be more conservative. Uh, there was a, because of that, economics was more private sector-oriented. Capitalism was very stressing the shareholder, uh, work was physical, uh, production was industrial, we'd refined that over the last couple hundred years, and geopolitics, because of that oil, was in the Middle East, and we had to go to wars and all kinds of stuff around that, to basically keep the oil going, then boom, boom, boom. That's, that is a system we all get. That system, let's put on this side of the divide, that I started the whole thing out, right? Now, there is another system that's getting built, a meta system that's essentially made up of all these smaller systems. I would argue the meta challenge of this era is basically going to be climate change. Energy is increasingly going to shift to clean. Transportation is going to go electric. We're going to go over a bunch of these things. The culture uh, basically is more millennial-centric rather than boomer-centric. Politics is going to be, in kind of a historical context, more progressive, they would call this. The public sector is going to play a bigger role in economics, probably. Capitalism is going to be more broaden to kind of benefit all stakeholders. There's a lot of talk about that. Um, work is going to be not totally virtual, but going to be increasingly virtual in ways that we hadn't thought about before. Production is going to be more biological. We're going to grow things or tweak things to grow rather than actually build them in the classic industrial way. And geopolitics, from the point of view of the West, will be more Asia-oriented. Now, that world is essentially going over to this side. So we've essentially got this next decade, there is going to be a huge amount of shifting. And if you're in the risk business, this is something you're going to have to really figure out how to navigate. And the more quicker you understand that this is kind of going in the bigger picture, the easier your day-to-day -day job is going to be. I would argue. Again, hear me out. Now, there's another trick here in terms of the future about, oh, well, how can you actually think through the future around technologies? Well, there's a thing called the uh, technology adoption curve, which is well understood uh, here, in, here in the heart of the technology world here. But essentially, every technology and ultimately every trend gets to a place where if it's successful, you go through innovators taking the new technology, early adopters are kind of pick it up earlier, there's an early majority starts to pick it up. Ultimately, you get the late majority and you get the laggards eventually come through. That's all kind of understood. This happens over and over again. Not every technology does this, but the ones that are successful do. The key thing is that tipping point. When does that come? My business, my work, is always trying to call that. And there's a way to think about that. And what makes that interesting is for a long time, a new technology, people think linearly, right? And so you think, well, there's this new thing. Gosh, this mobile phone, it should actually work. Well, but no one, you know, and then you're disappointed for a little bit, and then all of a sudden it starts to pick up once that, that scaling starts to happen, and then boom, it just gets amazing how fast this stuff happens. And we've seen it again and again and again, which kind of brings up these paradigm shifts. Because a paradigm is a, the way the system works is built on the current technologies, the current ways people have been educated, a bunch of things like that. The old thing will always hang on because people are certain, I get how it works, why would I want to let go? Then a new thing comes around, a new technology like, or a new kind of thing, like what if you did 
let's say, pick, got taxis to come through an app, you know, and that's, that's a cool idea, but you need enough people to try it out and go, oh my God, this is so much better than taxis. And then the whole thing kind of shifts and there went the taxi industry, right? We've seen this again and again and again. This happens with technologies, it also happens with trends. The kind of Me Too movement, or you know, so for a long time there's the norms around how to treat women and all of a sudden it changes, right? And it happens overnight and everyone's like, what the hell happened? Um, so anyhow, that is a secret to paradigm shifts. So you gotta think, what, so, when are you gonna jump into the new paradigm? So I'm gonna run through some of these to you. And I'm gonna do this as fast as I can. There's not, so, you know, we don't have a lot of time to hit all of them, but I could go on for a long time here. But the first one, which is inexorable at some level, but I also call it a paradigm shift, is the climate paradigm shift. I wanna basically get into, uh, this used to be a debatable thing at some level, but it, the science is so clear here, I just wanna lay it out here because it's gonna create, impact the risk world in a million different ways here. So this is if you take the CO2 in our atmosphere, this is what traps heat for climate change. So from the time of Jesus, for the last 2,000 years, you know, our, it was pretty much stable, and then the Industrial Revolution came along and we started punching it, putting it up into the air, right? And then it got up to this area. That's kind of understood. It's even more crazy than that. If you go back to the beginning of human beings, what is a modern human being with our minds and stuff kind of came up about 200,000 years ago. This is essentially uh, the carbon in the atmosphere since humans have been around. And we know this through ice cores and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and these are ice ages, by the way, those peaks. We are in territory where humans have never lived like this, right? Now it can get a lot worse. It can go way up. And then you're like in where the dinosaurs were, where there were no ice at all, and the water is 100 meters higher. But anyhow, the point is, this is bad direction to go. And so what's happened with carbon energy is essentially we've been building through the Industrial Revolution. But here's the secret I want to point out to you here. We can spend a lot of time on this. See the developed countries like United States, Europe, we started to flatline in uh, 1980 to 2020. Why? We started to understand that we had to have a lot more efficiencies and we were able to kind of hold essentially on our carbon as best we can. It's the developing countries that in the recent years have been actually pushing the numbers up. But anyhow, I want to point about that hold because what's been going on with all this talk in you know, COP26 they just had uh, is we have to figure out a way to bring down bring down, top off, not just keep it steady, but we have to drive it down. And that's what's gonna basically be ahead of us here. Now, this, it's gotten to the point where big finance, global finance, everyone's kind of wrapping their heads around this. It's not really a debate anymore. So whether or not you wanna believe this or your politics are different, just, it's gonna structure your world. You just gotta come into that. Now, luckily, there's actually a lot of crazy, interesting things have happened. Clean energies, for example. Now. If you would have taken last decade, the 2010s, and you would have said, hey, is this clean energy gonna take off or not? That would be about a 50-50 thing. But honestly, boom, we have now hit the point where it's tipped, I would argue. And you're starting to watch, and why did it tip? Well, the technology of solar cells, just like digital technologies, has come ramping down and, and gotten to the point where it's so cheap, it's actually cheaper than carbon energy right now. And in fact, so that started to ramp up solar cells. So you started to watch solar starting to really tra track up here. This is just up to 2020, but it's just continued to go scaling here. And what happened with that? It's actually hitting that exponential growth, the logarithmic growth. This is a chart of logarithmic growth. Solar is now mapping onto that classic doubling, doubling, doubling thing. And it's been doing that through the last three decades here. So anyhow, there is a thing now where you can see this is what the United States has to shift to, theoretically, this is the Biden administration talking about this, is that blue lines of what we have to shift into solar. The, the red is essentially the default, just without kind of pushing it harder. And, uh, but anyhow, we could actually get to 100% uh, solar by 2035, uh, in terms of the electric grid. You can get a renewable electric grid uh, if you want to do that, and that's part of what's being pushed here. So then shift to, to, to the electric. And I'm laying this out earlier because everyone can kind of map this onto what they're watching. If you would have gone back 10 years ago and said, hey, are electric cars gonna take off or not? You'd probably have to say no, they aren't. They haven't done it for decades. But then along comes Tesla, Elon Musk and Tesla, proves it can be done, and now the entire industry is going electric. I mean, if you watch the Super Bowl, it's like all the ads are like electric vehicles now, right? That is done. That decision has been made. It's happening. 
And so what's happening, why did it happen? Well, the cost of batteries came down, just like all these technologies. The cost of batteries, by the way, um, are expected to go, continue to go down as you scale through, the and through this decade here. And so you're starting to watch the same ramping up is going on, which is the global inventory. This is again to 2019, this slide. But uh, the latest numbers are now it's about 10 million new car, now 10 million globally new cars of electric are coming. Some places like Norway are at 90% of new cars are now electric in Norway, among other places. This is happening. So these are kind of tipped. Uh, oh, and then by the way, so this is a credible projection of up till 2040, how you're gonna see the growth of electric battery cars, hybrids are in between using both technologies and ultimately throttling back internal combustion. And if you don't believe this, talk to you know, the CEO of, of uh, General Motors or, 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 or Dandler Benz or whatever, they're, all, they're doing it now. So it's a really interesting thing. Now, autonomous driving, I know one of my colleagues here is from Waymo. This one is a critical uncertainty about whether this will play out, because if this happens, and all cars, or most cars, go kind of uh, autonomous, then you could restructure cities in many ways. You could claim back all the parking space. You wouldn't need individual cars. You could share the cars. Everything, the cars could just never stop. They'd just keep picking people up. And you know, it really blows your mind on how you could reshape cities. That one, though, it's not clear, whether it's going to be this decade or next decade. I think it's going to go. And I think we're going to see it. But I hedged it. I said it at 60. I didn't say it's going off, rolling off the chart here. But what's going to basically keep an eye on it is the trucking industry, because that would be the first to go. And one of the reasons all this supply chain problems right now, we can't get anyone to drive trucks right now. Nobody wants to drive a truck. Who wants to drive a truck? You don't, you don't see your spouse. You're, you, know, you never miss the kids' soccer games. I mean, all the boomers are retiring. There's no millennials. Nobody's taking those jobs. They're probably going to basically be autonomous, and they're probably going to start on the freeways. And ultimately, uh, anyhow, this is coming. And then once that happens, it'll drive the whole thing. So anyhow. This is another credible thing. Now, laying out those things and kind of think, okay, you can kind of think through the technology. I'm gonna shift here quick, and this is the point where it might get a little difficult, but I, you cannot talk about risk unless you think about politics. So even though it's a difficult, complex thing, I'm gonna to try to do it very balanced here in a way, so everyone can kind of stay open. But just here's what I think is happening. And you know, maybe you don't agree, and, and maybe uh, you'd also don't want to see this, but whatever. I was just going to lay out to you, I think what I think is where this country is going, and ultimately the West is going to go. Uh, if, if there was a more of a global audience, I could lay it out in that terms. Um, the big thing about politics is really, it's, it, behind the shifting is going to be generational change. It's like, like I say, once you're born, you know exactly when those people are going to be 80, and you know whatever, all where they're going to be in their life cycle. So this is, and this is a really kind of crazy, uh, this is the United States population by generation, basically now, roughly, it's 2020. And that, in between those shaded places, is the gutsy economy. This is what people, voters, this is workers, these are the consumers, that's where the game's played right now. And already, the world defined by the baby boomers are literally retiring, but also are literally dying off, right? Um, and meanwhile, all the millennials are basically fully engaged now. So whatever the millennials think are gonna is really matters more now than what the boomers think, and that's just gonna continue. So if you go another decade out to 2030, not only do you got the millennials there, you got the Gen Z there. Now Gen Z and millennials are very similar in their attitudes towards many kind of issues, Black Lives Matter, and all kinds of stuff that are going on that they're aligned on these things. And, and the boomers, like I say, by that time, will all be retired. And Gen X is a smaller generation. I know there's probably a lot of Gen Xers here. Sorry, it's just you're between the two <laughs> giant things. And don't impact, can't impact where it's going. Anyhow, this is coming in 2030. And ultimately, uh, this is 2040, just to go through fast. It just keeps playing. We don't know what's coming behind. But, and you know, who knows? It'll be the kids of the, of the Gen Zers and stuff. So who knows at this point in 2050? But that's driving culture, that's driving politics, that's driving consumers, that's driving your workers, that is the game. Another thing that's happened here in the big picture from America, um, less so in Europe uh, and other parts of the world, but there's been two giant immigration booms in the United States. One was the one everyone thinks about, which is the late 19th century, that's uh, 1840 to kind of the Great Depression, which is European, essentially all those greens are like Italians and, and Irish and stuff like that. But there was another one that's kind of started really more in the 80s, is the bigger boom here. 
And uh, it's actually more people per, but it was, we were a bigger society. It was roughly the same percentage, about 15 percent of uh, our society was essentially first generation immigrants. Now that throttled back a little bit in this last decade. Uh, but anyhow, that thing is playing through America too. So this is the percentage of white people and the percentage of people of color. And that's us in 2020. And we're heading for sure by the 2045 or something, white people will be a, a, a minority essentially of, of America. And uh, that's like California now. If you've been running around, this is, I mean, Californians, whites are like 40, 2%, anyhow, they're in the low 40s. Uh, and so it's not just that different, but it is coming to all of America, basically. And it's driving our politics. So I would say, whether or not you just, you know, your own politics is thinking, what, there's been a giant pendulum swing that goes between government when there's more market emphasis or more government, government emphasis. I think we're heading into more government. Uh, what is generally called in historical terms a progressive era as opposed to a uh, conservative era. And that means usually there's more focus on the middle class and workers. It's a little more public sector has more heft. There's more kind of emphasis on equality and stuff like that. You're starting to see it already playing out in the politics right now. And again, it's the, how the millennials and, and Gen Z think about it. So the way to think about it in the biggest picture is that the era of the, after the war was what they would call a progressive era, using strong government, all that kind of stuff, to kind of structure, invest in public sector, all that kind of stuff. The next, that went to 1980. Then there was a whole, this happened not just in the United States with Reagan and all that, but also Europe, Margaret Thatcher and all. Then we had, we had an era of about, of a whole era of conservative politics, which was, you know, also has its benefits. It's kind of more entrepreneurial, it's more market oriented, it's more freedom focused. Anyhow, totally fine. I'm just saying we are essentially hitting, uh, we're moving back into, the pendulum is swinging back. And so regardless of your own politics about that, I would just say that's probably one way to think about your business, but also think about risk and think about all kinds of stuff around that. And there's a bunch of reasons for that. Climate will be one of the reasons they'll drive it, generations, all that. Now, this is, I'm just gonna touch this lightly, but I think it's worth pointing out here. One of the things that's going on is you could say the urban culture of the coast, which we call blue America, has essentially been ascendant like, and if you take the presidential elections, everybody in the, in the country talking, seven of the last elections uh, were won by Democrats. Uh, and, 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 and so there's something going on there, okay, that's happening. The last time George Bush, the second time, won the popular vote and actually had that many electoral votes. But since then, there's been these razor thin things about that, but this is essentially Biden's election See how that California politics is moving in the Southwest? The Deep South is even kind of turning, uh, struggling with blue there. Whether you like it or not, we're watching already a kind of a discussion of whether Texas and the South are gonna, the urban centers particularly, are they bringing blue state politics there? Again, just suspend your, what do you wanna see? But I would just say, if you're thinking about where the country's going, I would say uh, that's something to think about. And one last point about this, which is if you study history, basically follow the money. And basically these are the counties in terms of the percentage of GDP of the US that voted for Biden and for Trump this last time. And 70% uh, of American GDP is produced in essentially blue counties. And uh, there's no society that's been run by the 30% of rural people over the cities with that kind of economic heft. It just plays out. Now again, regardless of your own feeling, I'll just say, okay, that's something to think about. Uh, this is gonna play out. Now, we're talking economics. So I wanna talk about economic shifts. We spent, this, by the way, that picture was my first book called The Long Boom. So I've, thought, I've spent a lot of time thinking about long-term growth. If you went back, the last 2010, we were all were, 20, 2010s, uh, we're all worried about, oh, are we ever gonna get out of this recession from the great crash of 2008 and all kind of stuff. We were all kind of worried about going, slipping back in, low, tepid growth, all that kind of stuff. This decade, it's the opposite problem. We are gonna be in a boom, and an incredible boom. We're already in the boom, but it's gonna continue through this whole decade, and I'm gonna tell you why in a second here. But this is, in my opinion, we are in another economic boom. And what is the main reason I bring this up? Coming from one of the things that drives long-term economic growth, again, my first book was all built on this, called The Long Boom, 
is technologies. When technologies create new industries which just kind of totally change the nature of the economy, there is an incredible amount of scaling up that goes on to this. And what happens right now, this era right now, we have three, not one, not two, but three world historical booms, technology booms going on. We've got, essentially I talked to you about the, the clean ener the energy boom. Like think about the next 30 years, if you can't make money making that shift, you got it, you know, there, there's a ton of money there. There is, uh, there's essentially a bunch of biotech boom, which I'm gonna get to briefly a little bit later, but I just wanna touch here on those top three out there. There's still a lot to go in this digital boom, this digital technology boom. And uh, one thing that people underestimate is we got 60% of the people on the planet are on the internet right now. And the story of the last 25 years is how did that happen? But we still have three billion people who don't, aren't on the internet. Half of Asia is not on the internet. Basically, two thirds of uh, the Middle East and Africa are not on. 40% of Latin America still is not. We're gonna add uh, three billion people. Again, and if you're all connected up and you have kind of e-commerce and all the stuff that you'll be thinking about, that's bringing a lot of people. That's growth, that's crazy thing happening. That's one, just as one piece that's happening. The other thing is the arrival of um, artificial intelligence. AI is going to be, it's like a superpower. It will essentially be able to take humans, kind of what, what humans can do and supercharge it. And, and I'll give you just one example, which is that's gonna to lead to accelerated innovation. This decade, we have now gotten to the point where essentially we're gonna have simultaneous language translation. Perfect simultaneous language translation. You're all talking in English to your uh, Siri. Well, frankly, Siri's talking in every language, wherever the country is, same thing with Google, same thing, all that stuff's happening. It's getting pretty close to translating with accuracy to about 80, 90, it depends what you're using. That's gonna be 100% or close to it. And so here's the deal. You got English, that's how many native speakers of English, first language of English. That's how many people in the world have the first language of these other things. Now, how many people in this place can speak Chinese or Arabic or Hindi or whatever? Now, when you have a machine that when I talk to it in this in Hindi and it comes out the other one in English and the other person in English talks and it comes back in Hindi, instantaneously, think about the collaboration, think about the spreading of ideas, think about the access to information. These cultures are just gonna blow up open. It's gonna be a crazy time of innovation because innovation is all about different voices, different connections, different diverse points of view, kind of the mashup of people like that. Now, in this new economic thing, given the politics shift, I will say this, it was probably gonna be more progressive taxation. You're already seeing people talking about billionaire taxes. It's probably gonna be more regulation. You're already talking about how are we gonna break up the tech companies. You're already gonna see more public investment. We just saw both Republicans and Democrats with the pandemic put a lot more just public investment into the country. This is gonna happen, keep going. So it's gonna, think about how that plays out in your economics. But here's one that's controversial and people kind of get the wrong idea here. If you went back last decade and said, are we gonna have more or less immigration? You would say, oh my God, we can't even barely do anything. Now there was a vocal minority who was pushing this. But I am actually saying we're gonna tip back to immigration in this country. And one of the things that people don't realize because of the, how it plays out in politics and the vocality thing, this is, very, this, is the, this is the attitude towards immigrants from the early 90s where immigrants, red is immigrants are a burden to the U.S. and immigrants are strengthening the country. In the back, back there in the 90s, it was 60, over 60% of people thought it was, we should get rid of this. It is now flipped. Look at the other end. This is very, this is a Pew, the Pew uh, organization. This isn't just made up stuff. They've been tracking this for 30 years. And now, in fact, there's only people about under, it's, like, it's almost 20% of the country thinks they're bad. And with these labor shortages, et cetera, et cetera, you're gonna see a different shift there. I'm just kind of saying this like, Having you think through the future, uh, a boom is gonna be fed by that. Also robots, I don't have the time to go into it, but robots are gonna be doing a lot of stuff. Uh, and we're gonna welcome them. We're not gonna be scared of them. We're not gonna, be, they're gonna save our asses, frankly, rather than take our jobs. Couple things here, given the time, we gotta go fast here. Now, there's some paradigm shifts in technology. Like for example, these tech companies, are were they bad guys or good guys? I actually think right now with the tech class, you'd say, well gosh, they're kind of seem like bad guys. I think they're gonna be good guys. And that, even though I'm part of the tech world, so maybe you can say, well, what are you talking about? Well, here's what I would say, is for up until the last four to max five years, two, even three to four years, 
uh, both US and globally, people love technology companies. Like, what do you mean? You're, you're creating this phone that I can basically talk to my grandma in video? Like, damn, that's awesome. It costs me 500 bucks. It's insane. Oh, I can actually ask anything in the world and you know, get the answer back in a second. It's like, well, what's wrong with that? It's free? Awesome. It's like I can order something on the online and I, the package shows up the next morning. It's like three hours. I was like, damn, that's awesome. Like, who's opposed to that, right? But so there was a, there's a lot to be said. But here's the difference, the power of these companies. This, if you go back to 2011, 10 years ago, roughly, these are the most valuable companies in the world by market cap. Three of them are oil companies. One, Apple, which is just on the iPhone, was in the game at least. And that other one, by the way, is a bank, a Chinese bank. You go to 2020, all the most valuable companies in the world, the most powerful companies in the world, all West Coast tech companies, American tech companies, three of them in the Bay Area here, two up in Seattle. And these are trillions, not billions, they're worth trillions. And they're going more and more up the big uh, thing. So these things are huge, and so people are freaked out about it, and they should be. And now government's starting to think, oh, how do, we, how do we counterbalance them? Anyhow, the point is, it doesn't necessarily mean this tech lash is more like a recognition. Even the people driving these companies, and I know a lot of them, they, they didn't even think it through. Holy shit, what happened? Now we're, we, got, we don't even know how we got there. Um, now, I will say there's going to be these paradigm shifts. There's going to be things, how are we going to essentially through regulation? This is, you're the risk people, right? Will we break them up? Will we make them smaller? Will, again, privacy, this is another one that's going to be a big one around data. Is it going to be more transparent, more private? And software, is it going to be more open, particularly around AI, like so everybody can see what's going on, or more closed or private, in which who knows what the hell's going on? This is where crypto is getting a big discussion now because it's so closed, no one knows what the hell's going on on the other side of it. It's all encrypted. That's going to be a big debate. Um, all right, moving fast here, the biotech thing. This is, uh, in the next decade, the biotech paradigm shifts. Now, one way to think about biotech, this is like opening up an entire age or era. In the long term, that might, this might be the biggest development of the 21st century at some level. Because what's happening now is we have the ability to understand the genome, not just of us, but all plants, all animals. We can actually manipulate them very cost-effectively to actually change them, nip them out, nip certain genes out, evolve certain genes, meld different genes. That's doable. It's cheap. It's this thing called CRISPR that if you're tracking it. And you start to do that, and they're only going to get better and better, right? So then you start going, huh, we could maybe create materials instead of, you know, digging it up in the ground and smelting it in steel. Maybe we could grow trees stronger, or we could, anyhow, there's a bunch of ways that you could essentially grow materials, grow food differently, including meat, which I'm going to get to, and all these things that start to be a paradigm shift in, oh my God, we can actually grow the things around us rather than kind of build them in the traditional uh, industrial way. Now, if you go, so this is this big debate. And the question is, are we there yet? We, we know, we've gone pretty far, but where are we? I would say we're starting to tip, it's not, I'm not, but it's not rolling down that thing. We got a lot of issues around people's acceptance of genetic engineering and things like that. But here's some things you should know as outsiders who don't really know the technology. This is a logarithmic scale. It took us $2 billion to crack the first human genome at the beginning of the decade here. And now the cost per human genome is under a thousand bucks, and by this decade it'll be a hundred bucks. It'll be, in fact, uh, this is if you. This is the classic Moore's law, which is how the pricing of essentially computer chips came down. It took it 40 years to drop as much as this has happened in 20 years. So you got dirt cheap, kind of <laughs> genomes now. Uh, anyone could do it. The other thing is money's been flowed into the biotech in the similar way. I was here in the 90s when it was all going to the digital companies. This was a similar thing as the early 90s to the late 90s in the dot-com thing. This is happening now, it happened in biotech. And since the pandemic with the mRNA and all these new breakthroughs, there's just an unbelievable amount of money going to biotech now. So they got the money, they got the techniques, will it scale? So I'm gonna to talk to you about one thing here that you can kind of think about that's a good example of what might take off here. Cultured meats. Cultured meats is essentially you take a cell of an animal and you grow it in a vat. You just give it the nutrients, amino acids, water, various things that a cow 
would basically have to take by roaming around and chewing grass and stuff. Yeah, you just do it, in, it's much more efficient, but it's actually a doable thing now. So the question is, will it be adopted? I think, I'm not sure, it's interesting, I think it's tipping. You can kind of think about that a little bit. But here's what's driving it in that bigger picture way, think about risks kind of stuff is this is the world's consumption of beef, and, or not beef, this is, uh, is it beef? Yeah, total meat production. Is when middle class people in all these, all over the world, basically once they get some food, get, get, get some um, money, they want to eat meat, man. I mean, everybody wants to eat meat, right? So you've seen this go up to the point, and then in the meantime, beef in particular is the biggest impact of all foods on um, CO2 basically, greenhouse gases. I mean, just way out there. See that at the bottom there? Pigs and, and cat, uh, uh, chickens way up there. So there's going to be a driver here, and there already is a lot of pressure now. And so the question is, these are pulling out to about 2040. These are reasonable projections of how we're going to try to probably throttle back conventional meat. There'll still be the plant, this is the impossible burger thing, the plant-based meat. Cultured meat, though, is going to start taking it off, and ultimately, it can, you can do anything like that. You can be fish, you can be whatever, and they're doing all kinds of it now. You're going to see it in, in chicken and all kinds of stuff. There's 80 startups in that, mostly in the Bay Area right now. Okay, I'm going to touch on a couple of last things here as we're, or one last area here that I think is worth talking about is geopolitics. Uh, because, again, you got to think about that big picture, right? Now, oh, sorry. Well, okay, that place you just saw was China. I was a foreign correspondent in China, Tiananmen Square. That thing didn't exist when I was a foreign correspondent. Uh, it blew up, you know, it was a huge thing. One of the things that China did was they brought in all these peasants who were living on less than $2 a day. That's extreme poverty. They brought 800 million of them in to the cities and they got them working in the economy. And it is a crazy ambitious thing and they did it. And you gotta give them credit for that. That's the red, uh, South Asia is India. But in general, we brought basically a billion people, a couple billion, in, well, anyhow, the point is, huge numbers of people out of poverty, that's a good thing. But what happened is, China has run out of workers. So if you go back to the last, we always assumed, oh, China, the last system, they're always gonna be booming, they're always gonna have a huge economy going. It's not true. They're actually struggling right now. And Chinese power is getting more authoritarian because of that issue around that. We thought, oh, they could, they're getting more liberalized. They're not. And the Chinese nationalism is increasing. Anyhow, this is a bad development, right? Well, one of the reasons is, this is another way to look at population. The red is the Chinese population to, currently. Look at that young people on the bottom, old people on top. They don't have enough workers to hold the people who are still got a long way to retire, right? That's one child problem. They had only enforced one child per family, all kinds of stuff. The other one, by the way, is green is India. But anyhow, that problem is starting to really affect our relationship now, too, because China is now getting more contentious to, instead of cooperative. It's getting more separated. This is going to affect these supply chains. I mean, they, they, or they, I should say, these are critical uncertainties. I'm t making the call that it seems like to be tipping this way, which could affect the supply chains and the way you think about risk there. And then ultimately, the Cold War, which I hope won't happen, I was always thinking that was fading in the past. But it's unfortunately, you have to say, this seems to be tipping in a direction we don't want to see. Now, India briefly, I, we don't have enough time to go too into it. But I will say, India seems to be tipping to the place where it might replace China in the way. And partly, it's that population. In 2030, this is their population. They got all the young people they need to kind of drive a bunch of kind of new industries, all kinds of stuff. And they can also, they all speak English, or many of them do, um, so they can travel the world and kind of re-migrate to different places. Um, so that's interesting. So what we're starting to see here, and then we're gonna start throttling it up towards the end here, is India is on a path to raise their middle class the way China did and surpass them, actually. This is credible uh, projections. Now, when I say middle class, I want to say one thing. Global middle class are people who can get a scooter or an air conditioner or a refrigerator. They're not American middle class. But this is, anyone who's traveled in Asia or been around the world, like, which, which I used to do all the time, uh, this is common. Like, you think, oh my God, like, there are all these people, and these are middle class people because they got that scooter. They might not be able to get the full car, right? This is the world right now. Poor are less than two bucks a day. Vulnerable is less than 10 bucks a day. Middle class is the scooter, air conditioner, refrigerator people, and rich is everyone in this room. Basically, we are not 
what we think of as middle class are rich on a global scale. But here's the thing that's awesome is we're expected to add about 1.7 billion people to that middle class. And those are, the, those are the old ones I just showed you how it jumped above. And we're going to shrink the vulnerable and shrink the poor and grow the rich a little bit, but it's just not as rich as many. But that's a hugely good thing. And that's hugely, it's also coinciding with a trend, an inexorable thing called total urbanization. Just like we're getting these middle classes, they're going into cities. And for climate, that's a good thing. So what we saw in the last decade, in the early, decade, right, in the early part of 2010, more people on the planet are in cities than rurally. That's the first time humans have ever done that. That thing has continued, and it is going to continue to 2050. Rural is already topping out, and we are going to watch essentially 70% of the planet is going to be in the cities. And these cities uh, all over the world, including in our country. Actually, it's only 20% of America is in, 20% uh, of Americans are in rural areas right now. Even in kind of states that are considered rural, they're going to cities. It's just a thing. And it's happening. Now, you know, will the virtual thing make a difference? Well, it's debatable a little bit. You can talk about that. But I would say this is a thing to count on. And so what I just want to end here is a critical uncertainty is are we going to be more localized, more kind of regionalized, more focused on our cities and kind of staying away out of the world? Or are we going to be more planetary, more global, more connected to the world? This is a kind of an interesting thing about this era. It's not, there's a huge debate now. What's going to happen? You're watching it with the war, and you're watching it with Russia and, you know, reaction, and a bunch of things are happening around this. This is a critical one. I think it's going to tip. I think the ultimate way it's going to work for the world is that direction. Now, that said is critical uncertainties. You're the risk people. One big thing is, are we going to have more global pandemics? Will they be more disruptive or less disruptive? We might get pretty good at these things, even if more of them come. Are we going to be able to, lo be able to produce at a local level with 3D printing and all kinds of new techniques that will replace the giant global supply chains? Not clear. And the other thing is, can we get a handle on climate or not? I think we're going to get a handle on climate. But if not, then I think you might see people winding back into their own kind of doing what they can in their local, local areas. So this is a critical thing in this decade, but I'm an optimist. I actually think, to sum up, that that world that we're used to, that you all grew up in, grew up in that you cut your teeth as uh, Mary who retired there, her entire career was in that world, right? Um, that I think is going. We are going to, that's gone. I, I would go so far as to say that's over at some of it. See, you know, there's a lot of pieces of it that are going to play out or whatever. But I'm just saying in terms of where the energy of what's happening, it's not there. And I would argue these new systems are emerging now. They're not clear exactly how it works or whatever's going to happen. But that's, that's the energy of the future. That's where things are going. And there's enough of a toehold and all these things that you start to really think this going. And so you got to think about how do you assess that risk, but also where do you play that? Because I actually think in 50, 100, 200, 1,000 years from now, I honestly think, people are going to look back in the early part of the 21st century and say, man, that is when they went totally digital. They made, everybody got on computers, everyone got interconnected, and they were supercharged with this, the first era of AI, artificial intelligence. And they're going to say, damn, in that same early 21st century, they shifted to a kind of a sustainable economy, sustainable society. They basically figured out how to get in a clean energy and kind of grow things sustainably in a way that's not, you know, basically digging up the dirt and kind of screwing up the environment that they were doing before. Damn, that's when they went sustainable. And they're going to say, and that's when the world went global. That's when it really was operating on a planetary scale, which is a scale that really has to last if you're going to think about a long-term future for the humanity on this planet. And they're going to finally say, oh my god, wouldn't it have been an amazing time to be alive at that time? Wouldn't it have been amazing to be in particularly that critical decade of the 2020s when they basically made the beginning of that, laid those foundations, made the beginning of that shift, and ultimately laid the foundation for the world that we're enjoying today? That's what they'd say to us or say to themselves, I'm going to say it to you to end the day here and say, you people are here. It is now. You're not in some distant future. So it's really up to you. Of what are you going to do now? 
what are you going to do now, given the kind of situation we're in now? And uh, I'm going to wish you the best of luck, as you can possibly do, as we end this conference and we enter the heat of the 2020s. Thank you. Thank you.